gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, an old friend of Cherry Reds, Steve Diggle from the Buzzcocks, uh, who's here to talk about a uh, new box set, Sell You Everything, which remembers all of the band's reunion albums. Steve, thank you for coming to Cherry Red today. Nice to be here, yeah. So yeah, so today we don't want to talk about the original years of the Buzzcocks, from 77 to 81 or whatever. We want to talk about the reunion years, if we can call them that. So I thought we'd start at the beginning of that process. How did you get back together with, with Pete Shelley? And how did the Buzzcocks come back together at the end of the 80s? Um, well, I was, uh, I was in a band called Flag of Convenience, which is uh, abbreviated to FOC. Um, and we were doing some gigs in, um, in Germany and France, the locomotive in France and the Met Metropole in Berlin. And there was Builders Buzzcox FOC. So um, our old American agent, Ian Copeland, he thought the Buzzcox were back, but it was like Buzzcox FOC I was doing. And I wasn't, I wasn't doing any Buzzcox songs, I was doing my Flag of Convenience songs. But anyway, so Ian, the American agent, thought we were back and phoned us all up individually about doing a tour. And I sort of explained to him that it, you know, they built it as Steve Diggle from Buzzcox, but it's Flag of Convenience FLC. So, um, but from that, we hadn't seen each other for eight years. Uh, I'd seen Pete around in there, but as a band, we hadn't been in a room or anything, or, or been together for eight years. So um, that's how we kind of got back, really. It was like, well, do you want to do an American tour? So we went out to do an American tour for, I think, three or four weeks. Um, and that continued on then. It was like, do you want to go to Australia? Do you want to go to Japan? Um, do you want to play Britain? It went on and on. To, uh, that was... Uh, and that was with the original lineup, right? Well, not with, with the original not with Howard, lineup, but with the original United Artists lineup. With the original, what they called the classic lineup, yeah. yeah. Um, which was, uh, you know, Pete Shelley, John Barr on drums, Steve Galvin on bass, and me, Steve Vigo on guitar. Mm. Um, that was the original, what they call the classic lineup, yeah. Mm. Incidentally, Howard only did 10 gigs with us. Is that all? With less than six months. Mm. And he left, you yeah. um, know. Which was um, sad and a shock, but at the same time, it allowed us to evolve evolve from there. And that's when all the, uh, all the hits and all the classic thing came about. Mm. And then, um, then of course we, you know, we did all that. And, yeah. Uh, all so, that. so you play these reunion shows. Presumably, that you felt good being back with that original classic lineup. Did, did it well, seem to gel? Yes. Um, funny enough, um, I mean the way me and Pete Shelley gelled really was, um, uh, I think it was a, a place called Easy Hire in London, and uh, they had a bar. So me and him spent most of the time. Um, uh, bonding together again over a lot of Guinness, I think it was. Right. And, uh, you know, that was quite an important thing, really, you know. And uh, I think we asked about two or three songs and then went to America. And, uh, but the thing was, the old magic was there and the crowd were there mm -hmm. um, in the States and away we went, you know. And that got the Buzzcocks back together um, in terms of doing these tours. And I'd say it went on to... Uh, I think we went to uh, Australia and Japan, and uh, then we came kind of back on ourselves and did the British tour. You know? right. But it, certainly the Buzzcocks were back. We never really mm. planned anything in terms of all that. It was just like. Did you think we at back. that time that, because there was a big, obviously in the press, there was lots of stuff about Manchester and the Stone Roses and Happy Mondays in spirals. Did it feel like that you. Uh, you'd come back at this time when the focus was on Manchester music or do you think that did you feel a kinship with those bands at all? Um, well, in 1976 I think we kick-started Manchester by bringing the Sex Pistols to town and then we was the Manchester band and then uh, all them Manchester bands evolved during the 80s. Mm. By, this, by that time, we were doing our separate things. Mm. I was doing fine convenience, Pete was doing his solo things. Mm. But by 1989, grunge rock and guitars were on the horizon. You've got to remember the 80s with a lot of dance music, a lot of it. Mm. And um, 
you know, there was some guitar music, but, um, um, and we did our own things, um, but by 89, like, the guitars were on the horizon, mm. and grunge was on the horizon, and stuff like that, and mm. um, that's when we got back, you know, and um, so, um, you know, we carried on from there, really. So then... So we can't, uh, like, bypass that sort of 80s kind of thing in a way. Yeah, Having absolutely. said that, we were doing our solo things in different ways, you know. Yeah, exactly. But obviously, the spotlight was on a, a bit more of the, the dancey, housey thing at the time, you know. Sure. Which is fair enough, you know. So then, like, a lot of bands get back together, you start thinking about new recordings, and you put out this new single, Alive Tonight, in 1991. Yeah. So... Was that interesting, going back in the studio and recording again for the first time? Well, yeah, I mean, having done the American tour and then the tours after that, uh, I'm not sure it was on tour for a year or whatever, so it was time to record. It was like, you know, you forget what you have when you go away, it's always the same old story, you know, it's like, you didn't realise what you had at the time, you know. Mm. But sometimes you've got to take a break from these things and, uh, and do something different. Um, I mean, even Picasso, you know, he did the Cubist period and the Blue period, you know. But when it's a group, you've all got a bit together. You can't always do these separate. But suddenly we're back together and um, time to record, you know. So I like tonight. It was a great song, you know. It, it, it um, had a lot of weird harmony things going on. It had all kinds of things going on. A great pop song, you know. I think um, at that time, though, you, you kind of got, like, Navarre and these grunge bands, so um, um, it was still there for our fans, but you know, everybody's a time under the spotlight for a while, and then you know, you have to go away and get away what you're doing, you know. Yeah, and exactly. people follow you with that, you know, and always go on to the new things or new generations come up, but um, that doesn't stop things still being great and kind on, you know. So, what's interesting with this forthcoming box set is that we found this demo album, yeah. which was recorded around the same time as that single. Yeah. Um, do you know why that never came out and why it took two years before your eventual kind of reunion album, Trade Test Transmission? Um, uh, with, the, with this demo album we're bringing out, it's like, uh, we'd be in the studio here and there and there'd be tracks left over, or there'd be some demos we did that we never got around to doing, or, or we'd do the demos and then it'd be like um, time to do an album and suddenly you'd have a bunch of new songs so songs got lost along the way it's, and it's amazing sometimes you forget you'd ever written these songs you know or they're there somewhere because when you're on tour and all this and the haze of things um, so there's a lot of things lost along the way you know or, or, or just left on, on recording tape somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. it's very exciting now, the, the, the demo album of this box set. Um, I think that's going to be great for Buzzcocks fans. Even I'm excited because I'd lost, I'd forgotten some of the songs I'd written in there, you know. Right, okay. Or I didn't know whether some of these recordings existed, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, even the songs I'd written, some of them, I thought, I don't know where they are, I'm not sure when I've got a tape from somewhere. But courtesy of Cherry Red and Richard, he has discovered some of the tapes and all the lovely things you have to do to find out where these tapes and bits of things are. And you were saying earlier that it's a bit like when you were younger and you'd buy a, like a Beatles bootleg or something, mm. and it was like a little lost treasures thing. Yeah, the great, um, I mean, <clears throat> I used to love doing really bad demos because growing up with the Beatles and people like that, and like I say, I'd buy like a bootleg Beatles uh, album or CD and have eight versions of uh, Strawberry Fields. And even by the eight versions, you wouldn't even get to anywhere near the chorus of Strawberry Fields. Probably start off with a drum and end up with a bit of guitar and a bit of a noise here. And there. But that was always fascinating, that construction or the deconstruction of it to find out wow did it really start like that you know? yeah so <clears throat> sometimes i do really bad demos you know deliberately well, so yeah, yeah, yeah okay. you know you get lazy you think you know this is all it's all right to do it that way as well you know it's a lot of fun in that to see it evolve you know absolutely i mean actually you don't see many books or programs about the fact um how great the demo in its very 
basic form can be, you know. Yeah, unadorned when you, by, you know, unvarnished. Yeah, you know, you yeah. plant the acorn, it's just them early things before the tree even grows, you know, mm. that kind of thing. So I, you know, band saying, oh, I've got a demo, and then, you know, we just polish it for the other. Well, we're talking build it, you know, we're, we're talking an idea of a demo, really, you know what I mean? Mm. That kind of thing, which is fascinating, which is going to be right in the box set. Mm. And also, incidentally, about the box set, it's a. Uh, You've got well, you've got this this sort of part two of the Buzzcocks. You've got them early classic albums, but you've got these other albums that we did. You know, Modern, The Way, and all the other ones in there. That you know, um, they've got some amazing stuff on. You know, mm. and it's all been part of the journey. You know, as um, you know, when you're a fan of music or when you're a fan of a band, you go the whole journey. Um, that's why I grew up with a lot of people in my generation and, and people, you grow with a journey, you know, it's like, even if a band makes a duff album, it's still good because the next one's going to be something else, you know. It's part um, of the story. Yeah. 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 Having said that, all them Buzzcock sounds are great albums. There aren't any duff albums. No, 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 don't no, make them. No, no. <laughs> I should also, I wanted to mention, just, uh, it was but a moment. That, Go sorry, on. I, I just got to reiterate that, it, you know, that being with a band that going on the whole journey, it's not about hit records, it's not about this, you know, it's, not, it's about getting involved in that whole trip of following a band, you know, which is the best thing in the world, you know, I mean, it's... Uh, it's the most important thing about it. Once you're involved in a band or an artist and you start collecting all the things, that was what it was all about for me. You know, It's no good buying just somebody's hit single and not knowing anything about it. No, it's for life. To me, not, it's, it's a waste life, of time. not just for Christmas. It's a lifetime, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Tell us a little bit just briefly about the time Mike Joyce and the Smiths played with the Buzzcocks, because obviously that was quite a little moment in Mancunian pop history where you've got rock history where you get a guy from the Smiths playing with Buzzcocks. It was kind of a little moment. How did that happen? Um, Mike Jones was a big fan of the Buzzcocks, um, and um, what was it? somewhere in the nineties, John Marr left, <coughs> and um, um, you know we were looking for a drummer. So I, I, I came. I was living in Manchester at the time, but I came to London to audition a lot of drummers, and um, none of them worked. So I, I, I got back on the train to Manchester, and a friend of mine said, "Mike Joyce is not doing anything." Um, I didn't realise he was a big fan. We hadn't met once, but um, um, so we had a meeting, you know, we, we, we went to some rehearsal room and, and he was in the band. Now, now, I was a big fan of the Smiths and the Smiths was asking our manager how did the Buzzcocks do it and now we got my choice, you know, mm. there's a lot of... Um, Complimentary stuff with each other, let's say, you know, mm. I mean, uh, I think the Smiths like the Buzzcocks and the Buzzcocks like the Smiths, so... Mutual admiration society. Mutual admiration, you know. Mm. Um, going back to that song that I tonight, funny enough, um, I went round to Mike's house one day and I said, I've got this song alive tonight. And he said, how should I do the drums? And I said, do your classic Mike Joyce shuffle, you know. Because we're trying to play it this way. I said, what are you doing, mate? I said, uh, just do your Mike Joyce shuffle, you know your classic Smiths kind of thing. So if you listen to that track, it's, it's got that Shakespeare's sister, that kind of... Yeah, that kind of slightly jaunty... That kind of thing on the Queen instead of something, or whatever, I like to drop my trousers on the other one. Yeah, absolutely. But it, that's a classic Mike Joyce thing. Mm. And um, luckily it worked with the track a lot tonight, you know, but... Mm. Um, um, so, you know, Mike was a man with a lot of mutual admiration and he worked well with him. Okay, but then in 92 you kind of arrive at a more settled lineup. You bring Tony Barber in on bass, Phil Barker on drums. Mm. That, that seemed to bring some solidity to the band in terms of that was a functioning unit for quite a few years, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, um, I mean, we were looking for a bass player and then the, he brought a drum along, which was Phil, just to stand in. Um, It can get a bit difficult looking for people, really. It's like, how do you find another buzzcock? You know what I mean? It's mm. like, they're hard to find, you know what I mean? You can't just go out <laughs> and find a buzzcock. Yellow pages. Or anybody in the band, you know what I mean? You've got to find the right person. You might have to audition a million people and all that. Mm. 
Well, me and Pete were never any good, and it's like, oh, this is boring, trying to look, you know, auditioning people, all that stuff. Um, but um, Tony came along, and he seemed to know a lot of the songs. He knows some songs we'd forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why he got a job at one point. And um, he brought Phil along with him. Oh, he's just a drummer standing in. And, um, and Phil was okay, Phil worked as well, so suddenly he had a rhythm section there, so we said, we'll take the ball for you, you know. Mm. So it was like, well, you know, they seem to work together, so let's, let's have that. And so yeah. that was a classic lineup for a while. Too. Absolutely. So then your first album proper for the new lineup was Trade Test Transmissions. Yeah. Do you have from I mean, do you have from memories of that record? That was kind of the first one out of the blocks, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, um, for a lot of Buzzcocks, uh, you know, the uh, very enthusiastic fans, that's like one of the greatest albums, you know. And and it is really a great album, that you know. I was listening to a track called Energy the other day, I'm thinking, wow, that's kind of weird. It's out there, but it's you know. It's in there as well. Um, but it's a lot of great tracks on that Trade Test album, yeah. Um, it, it, it makes an album, you know, it's, um, it should be normal, you know, yeah. really. And I think you wrote maybe a third or a few more of the songs. Was that a conscious thing when you came back that you wanted to be really, a, a, you know, an integral part of the songwriting as well as just singing and, and playing? Oh, yeah, when we split up, it's like I was writing a lot more then. And, um, uh, you know, I needed to do that, you know. Mm. And I think, it com I think it broadened the albums out and it complemented what Pete was doing, but also, I mean, don't forget, um, I wrote Fast Cars, I wrote Promises, I wrote the groove to I Can't Touch It, but Pete sang them, so they think they're his songs, but they were my songs, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I sang my own songs in the Buzzcock stage, which people thought, oh, those are mine and Pete sings them, but there's a lot of songs I did Mm. Uh, you know, that Pete sang as well in the early days, but it's like, what we really realised what it was, it was like, like, say with Promises, it was going to be a song, a political song, and he wrote these love lyrics. It's like, yeah, after that, you write yours, I'll write mine, because I need to say what I'm saying on here. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So it worked better that way. You know? It's so, kind of like the Lennon McCartney thing. They wrote together in the early days, but they wrote separately. Yes, in general. A lot of bands do that. And it's not for any bad reason. It's just like, I know the way this one goes. He knows the way his one wants to go, you know. Mm. So it's like, okay, but somewhere in the middle, we'll middle we, you know, in the middle, we'll meet. We'll yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, but also, it's like, yeah, when I come back, because I was doing my own band for... Um, uh, and I put quite a lot of records out on that, and um, and um, it was like, well, things have changed now, and it's grown a lot more, and we, you know, we, we're in a new era of the Buzzcocks then, and mm. um, you know, I had all these other songs, you know. So um, I've got to mention, of course, that you played, you were support band on the last Devon Nirvana tour. What mm. are your memories of that? Were, were you a big fan of Nirvana? Um, what happened with Nirvana was. Um, we, funny enough, on the trade test transmission tour, um, we were in Boston, and we used to have these six, uh, I had six televisions behind me uh, every night. Uh, we, had, we had like a, a whole bank of televisions. So I'd smash these six televisions every night. We were all around Britain, all around Europe. We used to get these second on televisions and um, play a bit of porn and all through them. And when we got to Boston, I'd, I'd, I'd perfected the art of smashing the, the yeah, hitting the screen, and uh, you know he would uh, the screen would ping and implode, and the smoke would come out. But it's not as easy as it sounds. If you clumsily do it, the glass breaks, and that's it. Well, the reason I'm telling you that is because when we come off the stage in Boston, the whole Nirv Nirvana came back. You know they they had the Teen Spirit, and Nevermind was number one. They were like number one band around the world, I guess, at the time. And uh, Kurt said that, I love the way you smash the guitars, man. <laughs> uh, it's not the guitars, so the television. Yeah. And um, I said, there's an art to that. I said, Kurt, you've got to throw it, let go of the, uh, the, the mic stand, 
and it will, the screen will implode and the smoke comes out. You know? So I said, when I was in Berlin, I think it was, I hit the screen with an old steel stand and I nearly got electrocuted. It could go up and smoke, you know, the capacity. There's a skill to it, yeah. It's only the adrenaline I managed to get off there. I thought, I'm going to die, I'm getting electric shock from this. So, um, I told him about that, but he looked on it and he said, I've only smashed one television. I said, I've just smashed thousands this year, you've not lived, man. I'd show you how to do it. But he loved all that, you know. Mm. And, and I had perfected it, I was smashing the screen, so. Right, okay. Uh, the next minute we was doing the, uh, he said, give us a call, and we did that last tour in Europe with Navarre, you know. Mm. But he was a big fan of the band, and I think they all were Dave, and, um, you know, um, they were big fans and we got well with them anyway. It was a great tour, right? you know, Dave mm. and Chris and everything. We loved them. They was in our dressing room, we was in theirs, and uh, we had a mutual respect, you know. I mean, they was like half speed punk in some ways, yeah. a bit Zeppelin y, you know. But, um, you know, they had some great albums and a great band, you know. Dave yeah, was absolutely. a great drummer. You know. So, back in, so this is 94, back in Britain, Britpop's happening and Buzzcocks were a huge influence on that. Yeah. Did you kind of feel at the time that was a kind of almost, you could feel that your music was becoming more valid or more influential on what was happening currently? Well, yeah, you know, uh, Buzzcocks were very definitive in their own style, you know, you, you, a very unique style really that we kind of created, which you kind of don't realise when you're doing it, but it's like, as soon as you hear Buzzcocks, you go, honest oh, Buzzcocks, you know. Um, but uh, we had an album launch once in Soho and uh, the whole of Blur came. I was at that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was there, they were so, down the front, like, weren't they? Yeah. That was for trade test yeah. transmissions, wasn't it? I think. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, and I was yeah, at that yeah. gig, yeah. And they came yeah. to that yeah. and... Uh, <coughs> and um, I remember Damon, oh, so, Damon nodding his head like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think the oldest one, you know, that one, woo-hoo, that yeah, song. Yes. Well, he's yes. got the, I'm Some on time. my own now. Nothing left. Mm. Sounds a bit like that. Da, 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 you know, that one. Woohoo. Okay. There's a bit of copyright going on there. <laughs> I might let him off. But if you put them two songs together, uh, you'll hear a very close melody, but you know. Whatever, yeah. The artist borrows the genius steals. So let's put it that way, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> there was so, a few quick for that. So your next down. But also, uh, you know, I think Liam, uh, you know, Oasis. Like it's a bit because we're Manchester, you know. Mm. Um, no, it definitely felt to me like Buzzcocks and some <coughs> other band. You know, it was like yeah. ebbs, influence ebbs and flows in rock history, and that was a time when suddenly your music was, yeah, was the, back in vogue, if you yeah, like. Yeah, because, um, you, know, you, know, you know, we had the kind, those kind of songs, and, um, you know, I had, I had a bit of that muddy Britpop image before the Britpop, really, you know what I mean? Mm. But, um, mm. So it was all that kind of stuff going on. So it was an empathy. It was like, oh, they're, they're the guys before us, really, the bit part. They was kind of, the Buzzcocks, yeah, yeah. Inspired them. Well, we wrote them classic three-minute songs like the Britpop people did. <coughs> and, mm. and like I say, Blur and Oasis and people like that, you know, you could see that was the next evolvement, you know, but... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of empathy there, you know. Mm. So your next album... I know Liam said he liked the Buzzcocks, and I know... All does, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Especially coming from Manchester as well, they kind of yeah, it's an affinity understand there. where we're coming from mm. and they took it on to their next level. Of, what of course, doing. yeah. So then you signed to IRS for All Set, which felt like an album where it was a step up from Trade Test in terms of the investment. It, was, it seemed like a bigger budget. You record it at Fantasy Studios with... Uh, was it Neil King who worked with Green Day and people like that? Mm. And um, was that that feel quite exciting? Because also it kind of, in a way, it was in, it was them playing to this new punk pop that was happening in America, which again was very influenced by Buzzcocks. Um, it was nice working in Fantasy Studios because you thought, oh, the history of the Creedence Clearwater Revival stuff and all that. Mm. Although during the course of the thing, you found out that uh, I think the management owned it now, and not the band, which is a bit of a disappointment. Right. But um, it was one of the weird things where we did the drums in one studio and then the guitar was in another and the vocals in them. My only sadness about that one was uh, there's a song called What Am I Supposed To Do Now, which is a great song, which people love after that. 
Um, and then I met Booker T in there, he had an office in Fantasy Studios, uh, Fantasy Studios, and they, um, we said, will you play the, the keyboard on this? And then he, uh, he said he would do it, and then he kind of disappeared for a week. We would follow him up every day. Oh, no. So he was there, but... And yeah. He said he loved me too, but something happened to him, I don't know why. Because mm. yeah, he had an office in there, he would have done it. But that would have been a great honour to have Booker Young. As it turned out, we had um, uh, the keyboard player from Robert Cray's band doing it. To be honest, I could have done it because I did it on a demo and it was my song. Right. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it would have been lovely to have Booker T on that, you know. Of course, yeah. And it was great that Robert Cray guided it. Yeah. And that album, it felt like it had more embellishments and arrangements and other stuff. Was that just because you had more time well, in the studio or was it don't just... Don't think about the album. He, he, he had a lot of my songs in the back and Pete's songs in the front. When, what you learned from that, when you realised they should have been spread out a bit differently on that album. Mm. Should have been like two of Pete's and one of mine and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Which, you know, we learned... Not that the songs were... All the songs are great, but I, I, I think the sequencing, because I was supposed to go back and work with a guy on there, and uh, we was away on tour somewhere, but um, the sequencing could have been a bit better, you know. Sure, but yeah. Too many of my songs at the end and too many pieces at the front. Mm. Whereas on the subsequent albums, mix them we up. mixed them up, which more made variety, a difference. Yeah, yeah more variety. Yeah. So then, Having said that, it was still a great album. Yeah, also. but then after that, I think two months later, IRS imploded. Yeah. So presumably that was a bit of a body blow because this is the label you signed to, they've got big budgets, yeah. you know, fancy American studios and such like. So how did you react to that? Um, same with reacting to a lot of things, that's real life. I deal with it. Um, yeah. You know, you go on this journey for, a, you know, you know, I signed up to do rock and roll, punk rock and roll or whatever. And, you go through all these journeys with it. You've got to be tough, you've got to be strong, you've got to get into it. It's not about learning chords or writing music. and You know, it's about survival of all the other things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can do that, you can survive, you know. I mean, you, you know, it's a tough road. So these things happen, you know. A label collapses or they don't want it. It's like, well, yeah, we'll go on to the next phase, you know what I mean? Yeah. you know, always got to have that hope and belief, you know. So never uh, listen to anyone. That's the thing. Well, uh, so listen I'll... to your inner voice and what you want to do, you know. And you kind of do that as much as you can. Sometimes you have to concede to certain things. But what you learn as well is sometimes when you concede to something, you know the next phase it's going to go the other way, and so you know it's going to go even stronger. That's what I've learned from it as well. So you lose one deal, you go on another deal, you know. It's like we're still here, it's still the rock, you know. And mm. um, I kind of believe, you know, that's what I part on the stage, there's hope in my life, you know what I mean? Mm. So thereafter, Pete apparently commented that he was uncomfortable with trying to be a rock band when everybody's trying to be one. And hence the next record, Modern, was meant to be a kind of non-rock record. <laughs> It doesn't sound like a non-rock record, but it's definitely got more of an angular post-punk feel. Was that a deliberate ploy? Oh uh, yeah, you, you know, it's like, let's do something different, yeah. I was always up for that anyway. Um, but, um, so, um, yeah, we, it, was, it was like, you know, um, we'd gone through listening to the dance music in the 80s and all that. And I liked a lot of that, you know, you, you like a lot of things along the way, you can see why things are good and stuff. Um, let's bring some other influences in, you know, uh, and that's what we did, you know. I'm rapping on them, um, um, it doesn't mean anything, and um, I put all this rapping stuff in, you know, and I put this backing vocal in, beef, bang, pow, beef, bang, pow, you know, which is a subconscious image of, uh, you know, uh, the creation, really. Indeed, yeah. And putting that in, big bang, pound, and then you're looking through life through the wrong end of a telescope with this avant-garde dance kind of feel, guitars and all that, you know. So we took things in that way. Um, you know, that's as good as any fucking Bowie song to me, you know. 
He's Absolutely. got very vocal in a way, you know, mm. because he liked to you know, admit mm. that. Um, was it also interesting? There's that a lot of other things on there like that. We, yeah. we took a broad bit of electronics and stuff like that. Um, mm. And then, then it, it's like, oh, modern, you know, it, it doesn't sound like the old boys come. So it's like, well, look, this is a different album, you know. Mm. But it was a brave album and it's a great album. Was it interesting being back at EMI? Did that feel quite circular as well? Um, yes. Uh, Different EMI by then, of course. Yes, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it was nice to be uh, back there doing things again as well, yeah. Um, I just remember going up to the uh, executive uh, manager's office and he had like a special lift that was all padded. It was like one of them Steve Austin films, you know. <laughs> and he got there and it was a 70s thing where they used to have the parties and the the drugs and the thing. Oh, yeah. right, okay. So back I'd never, we'd worked in there industry. before, but I'd never seen that bit. But on modern, we were taken to this special thing. Ah, there's all the right. Behind closed that. doors. Oh, yeah. Blimey. It was a very secret thing, you know. So for me and I, you end up here at Cherry Red, the yeah. next record, mm. which felt like a very much a back to basics record. Obviously, he's yeah. not going to have the same budgets as, as EMI would give you, mm. but and it feels like a, a, a kind of proper punk record, mm. really hardcore. Was yeah. that, again, was that out of necessity or was that a, just a back to basics feel that you wanted to approach? Yeah, we, we've done the modern experimental one, so it's like mm. now let's get to, you know, back to them, the raw guitars of Buzzcocks again, mm. you know. Mm. Um, but also, um, it was a bit heavier, that one, you know. Um, it really should have had a title. It's known as the Black Album. It's just called the Buzzcocks. Mm. Um, but it's some great heavy stuff on that, you know. There's some, you know, it's another one that's slightly overlooked a bit as well, like all of them, really. And, they, you know, bringing these out, it was great. But, um, you know, for me, uh, and a lot of people, Six City sometimes is like, this is the sound of that album. That's that was a great song on there, you know. Yeah, I think Damaged Goods did a seven inch, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. But um, if you listen to that song, it's like that's the buzzcock right now. It's it's got the pop beat, but it's got the dry beat and the heavy beat and all the rest of it, you know. Mm. A lot of other great songs on there as well, but to me, that really epitomizes it. Right yeah, there. okay. So then, again, you move on. The next uh, adventure is uh, Flat Pack Philosophy at Cooking Vinyl. What, what are your thoughts on that album now? Yeah, but that one, there was talk of like, oh, do you remember when we had them all backing vocals and the early Buzzcock stuff, you know? And I think there was this little thing about people getting nostalgic for them early hit singles, you know? And it's like, yeah, we go in, in some futuristic way or we go back to, back to bringing some of the classic stuff back. So that's what we did with Flat Pack Philosophy, we brought a bit of them, oh, backing vocals and all so that So it's poppier for one of the better. A bit too. more poppy thing, yeah. yeah. If the black one, the Buzzcock one was like a bit more heavier guitar oriented, this one was a little bit more older, old fashioned Buzzcock. Ever fallen in love. Yeah, that kind of, of stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, and then you seem to take a break from new records. And uh, was, there a, was there a deliberate decision just to sort of move away from that? Or was it just circumstances? Or Because it was then sort of eight years before your next record the way, or an next studio record, I should say. Was it just that you wanted to take a break from that? Or was it um, just one of those things, life carried on? Uh, when I was, uh, we suddenly did a lot of festivals and tour around the world. And you know, once you get into that world tour thing, you can be around for two, two years doing a tour, you know. Mm. You know, you, end up, you, you go to Australia, Japan, you go all around Europe, you go everywhere, you know. Um, so we were doing a lot of that. And also I think, um, I don't think, I think, I don't think people wanted to write anymore at a certain point, you know. Mm. And it was like, well, we're doing all these gigs. Uh, he'd actually moved to Tallinn by this point. So it wasn't always easy. We'd only meet each other at the shows, really. Mm. Uh, so there was all that kind of thing where it was like we haven't really got time to record anyway you know. but each year I'd do a, a demo cassette I've got cassettes I'm going to blah 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 demos for the 
And he definitely, and I keep finding them going, we never did any of those. <laughs> so you've still got an archive of all yeah. these old songs that have not been done, not been I'm written. just moving now from a, a stories place I heard of, like my life of cassettes. All the demos ever did, and all the cassettes ever bought. You know. Wow! I know it's back in fashion now, but I've always been in fa- I've always been there with the cassettes. Wow! Okay. So eventually, you got, you got I've got thousands of cassettes. Right. I'm not aware of for them. Maybe every demo I ever made, every, and I keep going through them and finding all kinds of things. And, Maybe um, there's a, a cassette box set one day. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Because there's um, some amazing moments on them when you think, well, wow, that became a song. But hmm. before that, it's like, it's that magic, that first magic. It's like when you sleep with a woman for the first time. <laughs> it's never going to be the same after that. Right. And probably for a woman, for the man, to get it right. Yeah. Um, it's never the same. It's that first tentative thing. Hmm. And when you hear that on a, on a tape, it's like, wow, you know, is that sort of awkward sensitivity, but this beauty, this wonderful mm. thing that happens, you know. Absolutely, yeah. yeah but yeah. once you know that, you can never capture that, you know. Right, it's, okay. You know, you can get near. So mm. when you hear cassettes like that, it's like, whoa, yes. There's you know, something little, something. Something sensual, something, you know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Almost virginal about it, you know. Right. <laughs> so then, so in 2014, you released, um, what up to this point is the last studio record, The Way, and that was done through Pledge. Was that, was that a process that you enjoyed that the, because it, it sort of changes the relationship with, the, with your audience, doesn't it, where you're asking them to kind of help fund it, and was that an interesting process? Yeah, at first I wasn't sure about it. I thought, well, you've got to ask people to put money, but, it, but then I thought, when I, back in Manchester, when Virgin Records first started, I went to order, I went in to buy a record and they didn't have it in, you know. So I paid my money and they said it'll be in, in two weeks. He's got to come from America. Um, so I realised pledge, pledge was like a pre-order really, you know. Mm. I wasn't sure about it at first, but I thought, well look, people have just ordered it, it'll be there in a few weeks time. I, I used to do it in 19, you know, 69 or 70, whatever it was. Mm. Or whatever in the seventies, um, you you know oh, we haven't got it in stock, but it'd be in next week. You know they're bringing it on a truck from somewhere, so you could always go to buy this stuff. Um, so I, I looked at it like that, you know. Mm. And having said that, so we had the pre-orders, uh, we had the money there, and I thought, well, it's a new formula. You don't know what's going to happen. Let's, let's let's get into this new way of doing it. Ironically, it's. Uh, a new uh, business mode or whatever, um, but we're still making vinyl. <laughs> yeah. So it was a new Some concept, things, but we're still come back making again. old fashioned vinyl. Yeah. So it didn't seem all bad, did it? Mm. So we made the the way that that way. <laughs> okay, and if, and if if but the way was a great album as well. Mm. I mean. Um, it had some heavier, darker moments on it. And it had some pop moments on it as well, which was good. It was like, that's an interesting one as well. It was like, um, you had a bit of darkness and a bit of heaviness, and then these lighter things. So it was like, oh, that's where we're at now, because it's like, you can't write this. Um, I said to Pete, look, he didn't want to write with it. It was like pulling teeth at this point, but I said, write five songs, I'll write five songs, make yourself, you know, make it life easy, you know. As it turned out, we both came to the studio with ten songs each, thinking it should be... He said, I've got ten. I said, oh, that's weird. So he rehearsed the, the band with his ten songs, and I went in a few days there and rehearsed mine, because I don't want to hear your fucking stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't that, it's like... My Michelangelo don't, didn't paint the Sistine Chapel, other people did, you know. Yeah. So it's like, well, you saw it out with the other guys, and then I'll saw it out. It was just a practicality thing, really. But yeah. like, you've got 10, and so have I. Considering you didn't want to write this album, you know. Mm. Um, and I, I think that was a great album. You've got People of Strange Machines on there, from my point of view, and uh, there's some other good ones on there as well. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, there's some good tracks on there. Um, and I think that's a classic, but, but the, all this box set, 
they're all classic Buzzcocks albums. Yeah. In the later yeah. phase, it's like mm. somehow the spotlight was turned off for a minute because there's other things going on. Yeah. And uh, everybody has their moment. Everybody has their 15 minutes. But then, you know, then you've got to, you know, you've got to follow it on from there, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what's great about this. It's like, this is part two of the journey now, you know. Mm. Top of the Pops don't exist when we had those hits, but we're still making records, you know. Mm. And we're older, but... Why is that? Why, well... Maybe. Who wants to be fucking wise, you know? <laughs> Now, we're older, but hopefully, you know, we're having a laugh. this thing's still going on. It's going on better on the new journey, that's the thing. Yeah. Now, obviously, I have to talk about uh, the sad death of Pete Shelley in December 2018. That must have been an absolute, you know, the biggest shock for you and everyone in the band. Um, it goes without question, you were all kind of mortified by that, but it must have been really difficult for you to kind of decide what to do next, really. What made you decide, <laughs> look, the show must go on? Well. Um, uh, uh, me and Pete, you know, I met Pete when I was 20, going on 21. He was, he was three weeks older than me, so we were about the same age. And uh, um, we'd done 43 years ago, you know, mm. uh, as artists, as, as being the buzz cult. But also we had a lot of friendship, you know. Um, I would say, you know, he was a bit of an intellectual, you know, we both were in our little, little ways about the books and stuff, as well as the rock and roll, but... Um, uh, um, we'd spent, we had an office, but our office, we'd meet in the office and go in the pub across the road. And all these French existentialists used to, you know, drinking beach rolls and that. A lot of the work was done there, me and Pete Shelley drinking, you know. The others could never handle it, you know. When I first met him, I thought he could go to full eight pints at least, and we both did, you know. But we'd argue, we'd laugh, but also, we'd talk about a lot of intellectual things, we'd talk about all kinds of things. And, and in some ways, when you listen to the Buscox music through the speakers, there's a lot of things we spoke about in the pubs that are coming out. It's almost like we're talking to you, uh, having a drink with you in a pub through the music. In some mm. ways, mm. there's a reality about the Buscox music. Um, so, uh, 43 years and then the next thing he dies, you know. Um, so, you know, obviously I was devastated like the whole world was, you know, and, um, you know, it was a, a difficult thing to get used to, but you've got to get used to it. It's like, I can't bring you back, you know, that's, the, that's life, you know. <clears throat> I said to you earlier, um, I was in a car crash when I was 17, my best friend died. Then my father died, so it's like I'm trained with this deaf a lot, deaf business now, you know. Mm. Um, <clears throat> it's like I know the meaning of death, therefore no, I know the meaning of life. So I've got to carry on and live my life now, you know. I can't bring Pete back. The buscocks won't be the buscocks with Pete Shelley in the band. But also he told me uh, on the last tour, twice he came to my room and we'd have a little joint and a drink, and uh, he'd say he wanted to leave, you know. And I said, you're not going anywhere, man, there's a lot to do, yeah? And um, so he, he used to say to me, carry on with my blessing, you know, which is a bit eerie now, because uh, it was almost like, looking back now, he was telling me to carry on. Preordained. Oh, we know what we was now, yeah. So, Absolutely. Um, so you have to move on from there. So the decision I had to make from there was, um, well, either the buzzcocks are dead now or it carries on. Mm. He told me to carry on anyway, because he might have retired also. Um, and he would have loved it for me to carry on. He said carry on. Mm. I said, don't leave it all with me. <laughs> don't leave it with me, you're not going anywhere. See, mm. He's probably up there now going, oh, you've still got to tread the board, Steve. I'm up here. <laughs> I know what he's like, he's got to say. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of the fans said, carry on, Steve, you know. Mm. Now, I put a lot of solo records, I could do my solo album stuff, and still do a lot of what I'm doing with the Buzzcocks now. Um, but then there's the other two guys in the band that have been in the band for 10 years or more. Uh, 
And all the audience have said, carry on with it, Steve, you know. So I'm keeping Pete Shelley's songs alive and my songs alive. So that was my reasoning and justification for doing it. Uh, we've just done a tour before uh, Christmas there. And the feeling and the love, uh, uh, you know, it's working well, you know. Yeah. In fact, yeah. you know, it's ascending to a new thing. But also, what you've got to remember about this, Howard DeVolta was the singer initially. Um, and people were shocked when he left. And then, then it was Pete Shelley, now it's me. Now, if you go to the Victoria and Albert Museum, you'll see, like, the Chinese have these Ming dynasties. You see pots of the Ming dynasty of this dynasty. Now it's the Steve Diggle dynasty, you know. Mm. So, it was Howard, Pete, and now it's me. So. There's nothing new with this, really, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when Howard left, they said, oh, well, you're going to carry on, you know. Um, and that's the way it is. That's real life. You can't go backwards in life. We can't change a thing. But what we can do is go forward. And that's what we've got to do. And we remember Pete well. And we're going to do a lot of his songs. But on this tour, three quarters of the songs were my songs mm. that I was doing. You know, it's not like some cabaret actors, I mean. It's still real business. And the great thing is now on Cherry Red, we've got the new single, Go and Get Better. Which seems, the title of it seems to speak to that positivity. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. It's like, you know, what's been and what's done is done, but let's keep moving while we're, while we're all still alive and we've got the moment, you know. Mm. And uh, Go Go and Get Better seems like the positive title to keep moving on. Yeah, okay. And the B-side just is great as well, Destination Zero. Absolutely. That's the price you pay for trying to be a hero. <laughs> Which, we're looking at little bits and pieces, a little nod to Pete there as well. Yeah. Saying yeah. so you can be a hero, but you know, you can enjoy it while it lasts. It can yeah. come at a cost sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Steve, it's Bro. been a pleasure. Yeah. We're all going to die. Buzz to Cox, live. new single, Gotta Get Better, available, uh, limited seven inches and available to stream and download. And new box set, Sell You Everything. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure. Have fun this year.